Hey, it's Spoonie, and it's time for the March update on Kitten Space Agency. And this one is a biggie. This is the first time we are going to see something that actually resembles in-game footage. The operative word here being resembles, but it's still a big step from just seeing stills and developer tools. If this is your first time hearing about Kitten Space Agency, it's a game that's meant to be the spiritual successor to Kerbal Space Program after the disastrous launch that was Kerbal Space Program 2. And if you somehow don't know by now, Kerbal Space Program 2 has been all but scrapped as the studio that was developing the game has been shut down and the IP sold off to a private equity firm called Haveli Investments. So despite some rumors which I discuss in previous updates, the fate of KSP2 hangs in the balance. But honestly, who cares? Now that we have Kitten Space Agency, I have all but stopped checking for KSP2. Not KSP1, that game is still amazing and if you haven't played it yet, you should absolutely try it out. So where are we so far in the development of Kitten Space Agency? Well, first let's bring everyone up to speed with a short recap. We've talked about in prior updates the seamless transitions from orbit to the surface of planets. The developers have managed to accomplish this through a process of pre-rendering meshes rather than rendering them in real time. This process is called spherical billboards. Because there are no large scenes that need to be constantly updated or rendered, the developers are able to swap out these pre-rendered meshes for planets as you approach them, creating a significantly smoother transition from orbit down to the surface and back again. The lack of a persistent scene along with the freedom of using their custom framework called Brutal rather than a game engine that already existed also allows the developers to implement something called instantiable physics which means everything in the game is playing by its own set of rules rather than being constantly influenced by everything else everywhere in the game all the time. This gives a massive boost to performance and also allows for some really smooth transitions from one ship in orbit around a planet or moon to another one that maybe is sitting on the surface of another planet. Rocketworks also revealed some new hires of a few people with impressive resumes in the fields of mathematics and actual rocket science. Blackrack in previous updates also gave us our first glimpse at what kind of hardware might be needed to run this game, revealing that he is capturing these images and testing his work on a 2080 Super, which while that is a powerful card, it came out nearly six years ago in 2019. This is a good indication that this card and probably some much older cards will be more than capable of running this game. Although this is purely speculation and nothing official about minimum specs has been revealed. In January, we got our first updates on lighting and shadows being implemented on a craft. And in February, we got some further graphics updates and the inclusion of new shadows, some more amazing work by Blackrack, and the inclusion of axial tilts. So those are the main points that should bring you up to speed for March. And like I said in the intro, this is one of the biggest months we have had since the game was first announced nearly six months ago now. So as is tradition, the day after I posted my last video, we got some interesting new updates about shadows cast on planets and moons onto other planets and other moons. Basically, from what I understand, instead of using a mesh of shaders to create shadows like they would on a craft, they are using a package of data to tell the body where a shadow should be and how big it is based on the location of the casting body. This gives the planets great looking shadows without having to deal with mapping and meshes. This is also really cool because according to Dean Hall, this went from conception to implementation in just a few hours, thanks to the brutal framework they built specifically to create this game. And if they are able to add and remove things that easily, it means they aren't going to be afraid to spend some time experimenting. After all, not every idea is a good one, but it's sometimes hard to know which ideas are worth pursuing until you've started working on them. This will let them add shadows to planets cast by moons, as seen here in some preliminary stills, as well as from planets onto their moons, as we can also see here in this still of Pluto and its moon without any textures. Pluto has always been the least professional planet, but ever since it got downgraded from planet to dwarf planet in 2006, it has just really let itself go. I mean, put some pants on. Here's a cool shot from above Sharon showing the dark side of the moon along with a shadow cast over it by Pluto, demonstrating how this can cause just a small wedge to be illuminated under the right circumstances. Some more shots of Jupiter and one of its 95 officially recognized moons, Amalthea, which is a smaller moon that's shadow can be seen down on the gas giant. We were also shown some stills of Mars and one of its two moons, Phobos, casting a shadow down on the surface and causing an eclipse, as well as an eclipse on Europa heading into Jupiter. These are some very cool effects that are said to be running smoothly. I think they are going to make for some really amazing screenshots once this game is released. And I typically don't care for seeing other people's screenshots, but Kerbal Space Program was always one of those games that had me taking several screenshots and looking over the crafts that other people had made. So I'm obviously really looking forward to seeing the screenshots that people take in Kitten Space Agency as well. And here we get to see a still which shows a look back inwards towards the solar system from out near Pluto. This shows just how many planets, moons, and other objects we are going to be able to visit. 
As I mentioned earlier, Jupiter alone has 95 official moons, along with literally thousands of other smaller objects in its orbit. While it's obvious they won't include all of those small objects, it does make me wonder if they will be including all of its official bodies. So will Jupiter have 95 moons for us to visit? Will Saturn have all of its 146 moons? Seeing as the game already includes several lesser known dwarf planets like Makemake in the Kuiper Belt, I think it's very possible that by the time this game releases, we will see a fully fledged solar system. With the brutal framework, it doesn't seem to be all that difficult for them to add in new bodies. And as we have discussed in previous updates, the game utilizes instantiable physics, meaning everything plays by its own rules specified for it and it alone. Everything is not affected by everything everywhere all the time. This is great for modders, but it also means that they can probably add in new bodies over time without having to worry about breaking what's already in the game. We were also shown some color and render changes showing off some texture and color updates to several of the planetary bodies as well as some 16K textures being implemented. We also got some more images of Black Rack's progress. And as I say every month, I think these are hands down some of the best looking clouds I have ever seen in a game. I wonder if they're going to be dynamic eventually as well. So will they be disrupted when we fly through them at high speed? I won't be disappointed if they aren't. That's honestly a lot of work for just a little effect. So I'm not sure if the juice is really worth the squeeze, but it is one of the many, many questions I have about what the finished product will look like. Speaking of questions, let me know what some of your top questions are. What are you hoping to see in the game that hasn't been mentioned, and what are you hoping doesn't get added in? Let me know in the comments down below. I really enjoy reading what everyone else thinks about this game so far. To answer a big question I had earlier about whether or not multiplayer was going to be a focus, it looks like we have a definitive answer, and that is yes. Multiplayer will be a part of this game. This isn't really news as much as it is a reaffirmation of something that we haven't gotten a ton of information about yet. In a developer update for some of Black Rack's work in progress stills, Dean Hall mentions that they have begun to look at sticking in the initial structures for multiplayer. This was in the context of laying the groundwork for later implementation, so whether or not that's something the game will launch with versus something that will be baked in so that it can be easily worked on down the road is still up for debate. But those hoping to play this game together with others, it seems you will definitely have that chance. Here's another picture of the solar system. This is not an exhaustive picture either, meaning it doesn't show every single body in the system. For example, the last planet we can see here is Jupiter. So Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto are all out of frame. But we can see a few orbits for some other objects like Borisov, which is the second known interstellar comet passing through our solar system, and the Oumuamua comet, which is the first known interstellar object to pass through our solar system, described as a rocky, cigar-shaped flat object that is expected to leave our system by the late 2030s. And it is really awesome to see all of these different objects included, but it does make me wonder how they will handle an object that isn't actually orbiting our sun. Will it only fly past once per playthrough? Or will it only be available intermittently? If I turn up the warp all the way, will I just be able to watch it leave and never be able to interact with it again? I have tons of questions, but obviously some realism does have to be suspended for the sake of gameplay. And in this case, I wouldn't mind if it was only sometimes available, or even perhaps on an extremely massive orbit. How would you handle something like this in the game? Would you prefer to see a singular event, or would you prefer to see something that recurred in case you weren't ready to visit it when it did come by? We can also see that there are plenty of dwarf planets included like Ceres, Hygieia, Pallas, and Vesta. We can also see asteroids like Eros, which is the first asteroid we landed a spacecraft on, as well as the Scott Manley asteroid, which I originally thought was just an homage to the YouTuber who has taught us so much about Kerbals and space in general. But it was pointed out to me that that is a very real asteroid, and I think that makes it even cooler that they included it. It's such a great shout out to somebody who has been so extremely influential for Kerbal Space Program and also this entire genre of games. We can get another look at the current system here in this short video that shows the orbits without the stars turned on. This gives us another look, but again, it's only out to Jupiter. Although here, we can see a few things that we weren't able to see in the previous stills. For example, Jupiter's moons. I'm able to count at least eight or nine moons already implemented for Jupiter, and that's just what I'm able to see here. These may just be the larger moons. Maybe the smaller ones aren't quite visible here. And we can see in a later short showing off some of the basic rotation physics that Haumea is visible, a dwarf planet in the Kuiper Belt that is not visible in any of the other previous system stills. So clearly there are still some things being added regularly. This video also shows that RCS controls are working, even under high time acceleration, which means that stopping your vehicle from spinning out of control by simply turning up the warp in Kerbal Space Program may not be an option here as the 
physics seem to allow for those high movements to be simulated even under high time acceleration. This is awesome, but will no doubt disappoint some people who utilized the time warp in KSP as an extra set of controls for their crafts. And who am I kidding? I am one of those people. Here's another video showing off some basic flight physics working and RCS becoming functional. This is obviously still a work in progress, and we can see a lot of aliasing on the shadows and craft, which is to be expected at this stage of development, especially during testing, because these things aren't fully optimized, and until we get a little further down the road, for the sake of performance, a lot of these things are going to be basically turned all the way down. As far as the UI updates go, we also got a ton of info this month. We get plenty of additional looks at the nav ball, which again, has some aliasing. But as I said in a previous video, that aliasing is something that I actually kind of like. And it's grown on me even more since the last time we saw it. Aliasing basically means that there are some jagged edges on rendering. And it's something that I think gives the nav ball in this game some character and a very old school feel. Especially with the off-white and black color scheme, I kind of hope they keep this. But what are your thoughts though? Do you like the look of the nav ball, or would you like to see something more modern? We also get to see some work in progress for creating transfer maneuvers. The UI for the maneuver editor is still a work in progress as well, and all of this is considered a placeholder for now. But I really like that we are getting some tools to make fine-tuning transfers a lot simpler than what we have gotten in other games. I have no doubt that the second I post this video, we are going to get a few more updates. But so far, that's what's new this month. Make sure you subscribe so we can follow along in the development together and share your thoughts on what you'd like to see included or excluded from the game down in the comments below. Please give a huge like to this video, it really helps my channel, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.